It is now time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, this government likes to say that hindsight is 2020 when they talk about the electricity crisis that they've created in the province. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the leader of the official opposition and I were in Timmins, and we welcome the folks uh, from the Timmins area who are with us this morning. But let's go back to 2014, when the city of Timmins paid $3.7 million for electricity. Now, Timmins pays $5.3 million for electricity, an increase of $1.6 million on the municipality's electricity budget. So, Speaker, how much more does the Premier think that she can squeeze out of the people of Timmins. Oh my. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise and uh, respond to the question relating to what uh, this government has done to ensure that we're finding ways to lower rates for all Ontarians and for municipalities, Mr. Speaker. You know, as as the Premier has said in the past, we've done uh, you know some hard work, Mr. Speaker, the heavy lifting to ensure that we rebuilt a system um, that no longer is relying on coal, Mr. Speaker, and ensuring that we build a system where we have power in the north, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to ask my threesome over here to bring it down. And if it doesn't, this will be the last time I'll try to be calm about it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, invested billions of dollars in making sure that we rebuilt our transmission system that was left in shambles when we took over, Mr. Speaker, back in 2003. And of course, that takes Answer. time and money. And what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is find ways of reducing those costs that we've had. And I'll make sure I answer more of that in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Supplement. Speaker, back to the Premier. The government has lit the house on fire, and they're trying to use the garden hose to put out the flames. Oh, Speaker, oh. let's go back. Let's go back to 2014. Quinney Healthcare, which operates four hospitals in my region, paid $2.1 million in electricity costs in 2014. It's up $600,000 since then. That's almost 30 percent. And if you go back to 2012, it's up almost a million dollars for the hospitals in my region. If the Premier doesn't want to talk about dollars, let's talk about doctors. How many more doctors is your electricity crisis going to cost the patients Orders. in the Quinty region of Ontario? Here, here. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's interesting to hear from that side of the House that they were actually going to close one of those hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and it was this government that actually kept those hospitals open and invested in health care to make sure that we have doctors in that part of our province, Mr. Speaker. So let's be clear and let's look at the facts, Mr. Speaker. We've ensured that we've got programs in place to help hospitals. For example, Mr. Speaker, in my riding of Sudbury, the Health Sciences North saves about $200,000 a year after using the Save on Energy program, Mr. Speaker. They're actually then putting that money back into health care services. So, Mr. Speaker, there are programs in place, there are systems in place to ensure that we keep the lights on, that we keep the operating rooms with the electricity Answer. that they need, and at the same time reducing costs, and we're going to continue to find ways to do more, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. It's time for this government to stop doing more because every th time they do more, it hurts yeah. more and more the people of Ontario. You know, uh, Speaker, just before the end of uh, the business day yesterday, my office was made aware of a family in uh, Chatham-Kent down in southwestern Ontario. The same utility that controls both the electricity and the water for this family, Integris, on Friday, when their electricity was turned back on, their water was turned off. And they were told that it would only be turned back on when they were no longer in arrears. Cities, hospitals, families, all hurting. That's your Ontario, Premier. That's your Ontario. Everybody is hurting. Speaker, what price is too high Question. for this government? Thank Good. you. Good. Thank you. You're working on it. Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are many electricity companies around the province that actually look after both water and electricity. But when they look after the water component, Mr. Speaker, they're looking at looking after that for their local municipality. So I would encourage them to actually contact their local municipality, Mr. Speaker. But we will find ways to continue to do more, Mr. Speaker, because if we were actually to follow what that party did, we would have left our system in shambles. We'd have relied on coal, Mr. Speaker, and we no longer want to rely on coal. We want to ensure that we have a clean system, that we have a reliable system. That's my line. So I would ask the member not to use his line. And it's not helpful when I'm hearing an answer from that side. That side is noisy as well. But it's not helpful when the person asking the question is yelling as well. I suspect he wants to listen. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, coming back to disconnections, Mr. Speaker, we, last week we had the bill pass this House unanimously, which was great news, Mr. Speaker. And I was pleased, very pleased, Mr. Speaker, to see that the uh, OEB acted very quickly and decisively, Mr. Answer. Speaker. So on Thursday, they issued a decision to all local utilities to make sure that they have all of these, uh, these uh, reconnections connected as quickly as possible. The member from Leeds, Grenville, and the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question is to the uh, Premier. Speaker, one year ago, hundreds of patients who travelled here from across the province watched the Liberal government strike down a PC motion sufferers had counted on to create a select committee on rare disease treatment. They are here again today, Speaker, one year after the Liberal government announced its own rare disease working group that would, quote, now begin taking concrete action. Speaker, it's been a year. What concrete action has the government taken? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I just want to I just want to say that we know that uh, many Ontarians have family members who are uh, struggling with a rare disease or disorder, and our hearts go out to them, Mr. Speaker. Um, but because uh, these, uh, these diseases are very rare, often they are misdiagnosed, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very, um, I'm very pleased that we've been able to move ahead. Just yesterday, Minister Hoskins announced an expansion to clinics for those needing specialized care. There's also, as the, uh, as the member knows, there's a, a working group of experts um, that uh, is in place who can explore how services for people with uh, rare diseases can be improved in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. These are very challenging, very specific uh, situations, Mr. Speaker, and we need to have experts who give us ongoing advice. In the interim, the yes, minister sir. has announced an increase to support for uh, for clinics, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Speaker, while we were happy, of course, to see EDS sufferers who were forced to come to Queen's Park last year get their clinic, the fact is that they had to travel to the legislature in failing health before the minister or your government would do anything. In fact, it seems this Liberal government only acts for Ontarians after they've been forced to come to Queen's Park to beg for life-saving support, and the cameras are on. While it may have been politically expedient to finally support EDS once the cameras switched off, so did the hopes for hundreds of thousands of other sufferers with cystic fibrosis, cattleman's disease, PKU, AHUS, or a host of other rare diseases. Speaker, it's Rare Disease Day. The cameras are back on. Will the Premier report where and what is the strategy to help Ontarians suffering from all rare diseases? Good question. Shin, thank you. Premier. Long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as much as the member opposite might want to try to make this political or try to make it partisan, it's been uh, the better part of two years, Mr. Speaker. In fact, this Premier led the charge nationally for the creation of a working group on rare diseases exactly. long before the member opposite raised this in the legislature. But importantly, Mr. Speaker, we did hear from patients with EDS, with Erlos Danlos syndrome, and thanks to their important advocacy and the advocacy of the group that often represents them, ILC Canada, we were able to create a task force which included patients and patient advocates on it, an expert uh, task force and panel that actually led to the creation of the announcement I made yesterday, which was funding of a million dollars 
uh, ongoing for a partnership between University Health Network Answer. and Sick Kids to actually provide specialized care specifically for children and adults with EDS. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of that decision. That's right. supplementary. Speaker, uh, this minister has had the Ontario Citizens Council uh, report on rare disease strategies since 2010 and has done nothing with it. He told us last spring we would have working group recommendations within three months. We're knee-deep in empty words. What we need is action. If he has the report, he should actually table it today. Speaker, when it comes down to governing, it's all about choices and priorities. Choices to strike down an all-party, open, transparent, rare disease select committee in favour of a behind-the-doors working group. Prioritizing to spend what's left of our tax dollars on the matters that will best impact the lives of all Ontarians, unlike relocating gas plants. Speaker, will the Premier tell us why, when it came to a choice between subsidizing a $140,000 Tesla owner ah. with massive rebates versus ah. spending to treat yeah. rare disease, Question. she went with a new car? Oh, Tesla. Tesla. Thank you. Tesla. Tesla. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, we decided instead of having politicians make these decisions in the form of a select committee, we knew from advocates, from patients, from scientists, from academics, from clinicians, we knew many of the steps that needed to be taken. So we created a working group, quite frankly, comprised of those experts, Mr. Speaker, a working group on rare diseases. I have not received the final report. I'm expecting to receive it in the coming several weeks. But a working group which is chaired by Dr. Ronald Cohn, a pediat pediatrician in chief from the hospital for sick children, Scott Mc. Mc McIntigart, who's the senior vice president of the University Health Network, Crystal Chin, a patient, Guida Closa, a patient caregiver, Dr. Richard Ward, a physician lead uh, at UHN in blood disorders uh, programs, uh, Dr. Pranesh Chak Raborty, yes, director of newborn screening Ontario. The exact and precise people should, who should be providing that advice to the government, they're doing that. I'll be receiving Thank in you. the next several weeks, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Exactly. Question, the member from Barnaby, Gorham Walton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier has said that she will look at fixing hydro. The Premier has had 14 years yep. to look at solving this problem yep. and four years as Premier. Now, four years as Premier and 14 years as a government to solve a crisis that they helped create. Ontario needs more than a Premier or a, an electricity minister to look at solutions to this crisis. They need someone who's going to act on solving this problem. Will So here's a question. Here's a concrete thing that this government can act on. Will this government act to commit to a real promise to end rural delivery charges? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, there are, uh, there are many ideas that are coming forward, and I appreciate the uh, the uh, member opposite putting forward uh, some thoughts, uh, Mr. Oh. Speaker. The reality is that we have committed to bringing forward a plan before the budget comes out, Mr. Speaker, and that plan will be a plan to reduce electricity prices immediately, Mr. Speaker. We have already begun. The 8% uh, reduction is already on oh, people's bills, Mr. Bills. Speaker. That's already being taken off people's bills. The plan we bring forward will mean more immediate uh, reductions, Mr. Speaker. Unlike like I would say the plan that was brought forward yesterday by the NDP, the cornerstone of which is a, a pillar, uh, the, uh, the, the repurchasing of Hydro One, will, will, which will not take and would not take one cent off one Answer. electricity bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, here's another idea: ending time of use fees. Ending time of use fees isn't just a wild policy idea. It'll actually impact people immediately and have a real impact on their lives. Take, for example, Anne Marie. Here's an example. Anne May. Start the clock. Finish, please. Take Anne May, for example. She's a senior living in Hamilton. Now, she's recently been told that she's got to start using an in-home oxygen-making machine, and that's going to increase her bill by about $250, which will pretty much double her hydro bill. Now, if Anne May could opt out of time-of-use fees, she could actually be at home, use her machine during the day, 
instead of having to be up all night and worrying about how she's actually going to afford and question. this machine. Now, the question is, this is how it should be. Hydro is a necessity, not a luxury. Will this government commit to ending this unfair, mandatory time of use fee? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when it comes to time of use, Mr. Speaker, time of use actually provides an overall benefit to the entire province by conserving power during peak demand, Mr. Speaker. But we do understand, um, like the example that was used by the honourable member, that there are some people, Mr. Speaker, that do need to use um, power during, uh, you know, peak times. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we've already started the process with our system operator of looking at actually having some type of alternative plan, having time of use and having a flat rate plan. And we're so far into this, Mr. Speaker, that the OEB has already started a pilot project looking at that. But the important thing for us, Mr. Speaker, on this one case is the individual that needs to use a piece of medical yes, equipment sir. can actually apply for the Ontario Electricity Support Program and see their benefit double, Mr. Speaker. And I do hope that Thank that you. person gets access to that information. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, people in Ontario need to see real changes that will actually impact their life right now to make sure that the hydro system is actually working for them. The Premier says they're working on it, and, but they've had lots of time. They've been in power since before Facebook was a thing. They've been in power since Destiny's Child was better known than Minister Beyonce. of Infrastructure, in fact, come to order. This government took power when people were still renting VHS tapes from blockbusters. This government has had a lot of time, but we're not seeing any results. How much more time will it take so that people can see some justice with respect to their energy costs? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've been in power long enough, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we've eliminated coal, Mr. Speaker. We've been in power long enough, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that our system is reliable. We've been in power long enough, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that people can actually use our system and not worry about it having a brownout. We actually invested in our system over the last 14 years, Mr. Speaker, to make it a better system than it was there before, to make it a cleaner system than it was there before, and to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that people who have asthma can go outside and take a breath of fresh air and not worry about having a smog day, which that we haven't had in this province since 2014, Mr. Speaker. We need to be proud of that. Other states, other provinces are looking to us, Mr. Speaker, because we've been leading the way in building Answer. a system that is clean and reliable, and we are taking it to the next level, Mr. Speaker, to make it as affordable as possible. Good question. Can you see it, please? You see it, please. Start the clock. Your question, Member Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said that if stopping the sell-off of Hydro One is a priority, then investing in infrastructure would have to take a back seat. Now. Just because the Premier says that Ontario can't have affordable public power and build infrastructure at the same time doesn't mean it's true. In fact, if the Premier continues to repeat it, it doesn't make it any more true. My question to the Premier is this. I'm pretty sure that Ontario has had public Minister power of Economic over Development. a century. And I'm also sure that over that century that we've built infrastructure, we've invested the member in from Eglinton Lawrence and transportation infrastructure. My question is, why can't this Premier do the same thing? Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting. The, uh, the, the member opposite makes the assertion that there has been uh, building of infrastructure in a rational way over decades. And, Mr. Speaker, that's actually not true. The reality is, the reality is that Remember there from were Hamilton long Mountain. periods, there were decades where infrastructure was not built, where investments were not made, Mr. Speaker. And we know that if there isn't a 5 percent investment in uh, infrastructure year over year, and that can be a combination of federal, provincial, and municipal uh, contribution, Mr. Speaker, then in fact, we're not even keeping up with, let alone building uh, new infrastructure that's needed. So we've actually tackled that, Mr. Speaker, and we've actually broken Remember that from cycle Hamilton, of East neglect Stony Creek. that had been in place for uh, at least 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Answer. So we're going to continue to build infrastructure because that leads to economic growth, Mr. Speaker, and that leads to the well-being of people in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, the Premier said that, quote, when she travels to other countries and talks to businesses about coming to Ontario, they want to know about infrastructure, end quote. I think that makes sense. And a part of that infrastructure is the cost of hydro. That's right. Now, does the Premier admit that sky-high hydro rates are hurting current businesses here in Ontario and discouraging other businesses from investing in our province? Actually, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you that in, uh, in all of the conversations that I have had uh, in other countries, the number one the number one issue that people raise with me is availability of talented, skilled people. That is, that is the number one concern, and it is the number one reason that businesses come to Ontario. You talk to Thomson Reuters, Mr. Speaker, the reason that they are coming here explicitly is because of a terrific supply chain of well-educated, talented people. So, Mr. Speaker, that, that is who we are in Ontario. Please. You see it. Thank you. Final supplementary. This is the same sort of false logic. By talking about the rising price of hydro, I didn't in any way talk about the fact that we don't have a talented pool of people. But it shows this government's lack of logical rationale. They can't address the issue. So, while talking on the on the topic of drawing businesses to Ontario. The Ontario government should also look at what the Ontario Chamber of Commerce has had to say about our current hydro system in this province. The 27, 2017 economic report states the experience that many households have with respect to rising electricity rates are amplified when it comes to businesses. End quote. The report goes on to note that the uncertainty with respect to these, chart, these rates are discouraging businesses from investing here and on this province, and that means less jobs for the people of Ontario. So here's the reality. We need to invest in infrastructure. We need to build uh, not Question. only affordable public hydro, but a public transit system and transportation infrastructure. But instead of selling a false choice that people don't believe, will the government actually Thank start you. to do that? Premier. Mr. Speaker, it'd be nice if the NDP would stop talking down our economy. Yes. Our business community and the people of this province and the talented people the Premier talked about have worked very hard with this government to build this economy up. They've created 700,000 net new jobs, yet the party opposite keeps talking their efforts down. That's not fair. And then they say that. Minister. Speaker, they talk those efforts down by saying they're part-time jobs. Wrong. 90% are full-time. They talk them down by saying they're not good-paying jobs. Wrong. 80% are above the average wage. They say that they're public sector jobs. Wrong. 75% are private sector. Wrong. You see it, please. You see it, please. New question. The member for London. Speaker, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, last week I questioned the Premier about a life changing therapy for cerebral palsy patients in the province and the barriers created by this government to access the surgery. Later that day, the government decided to approve the surgery costs for Madison Ambos in St. Louis. While we're happy for Madison, there are many other children waiting for support from this government on the already approved treatment. Speaker, Will the minister cut the red tape in his ministry and approve the other children who are waiting surgery today? Thank you. Minister Speaker, uh, and uh, this is a critically important issue, uh, access to the highest quality health care, in this case, uh, specialized surgery for individuals, uh, generally cerebral palsy uh, children, that can benefit from the surgery. That's why it is an OHIP-insured uh, procedure. 
We also rely on clinical expertise of specialists in this province to make that determination whether or not the individual will benefit from that particular procedure. Uh, that's what we've done. We've received thus far, I believe, 17 applications for out-of-country care. Uh, of those, four did not have uh, the uh, support of their attending specialist. Uh, I believe two uh, are still under consideration. Uh, uh, and, uh, and 10, uh, perhaps now 11 out of the 17, have been approved. And those individuals have gone for their surgery or in the process of preparing to go for their surgery in the United States. So this is a good example, Mr. Speaker, I believe, where we have a system that is and working sir? effectively. I understand there do remain certain challenges, and I'm working hard to ensure that our cl clinical experts are able to Thank provide you. this care. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Speaker, I have over 21 names here of children who are lost in the bureaucratic nightmare this government has created. And unfortunately, with this government, the only way to get access to services is to raise it in the legislature. So, Mr. Speaker, what is the government going to do for Benjamin, Alessandro, Maya, Athena, Lee, Griffin, JR, Nathan, Sonia, Davy, Ethan, Sophia, Taylor, Tegan, Leela, Bentley, Morgan, Brooklyn, Aiden, Chino, and Ben? Their names are on record now. We'll Speaker, act and do the right thing and get the surgery for these children. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, it appears that the member opposite uh, has recently obtained his medical degree. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, <laughs> we need to leave it to the clinical experts to make these determinations. Virtually 100 per cent of the time where an application for out-of-country surgery is made to the province of Ontario with the support of the clinical expert, that application has been approved 100 percent of the time, Mr. Speaker. Yep. We have two clinics in this province, one in Hamilton, one here at Toronto. We're also working with SickKids in Hall and Bloorview at the possibility of establishing the expertise to actually perform the surgery here in the province, Mr. Speaker, to provide that service not in another country but here in Ontario. So we have a process. I know the member opposite is wondering how long that takes. It's important, Mr. Speaker, that we, we it's an evidence-based decision. We work with with their Order. experts, but 100 percent of the children who have come forward with the support Answer. of their families, with the support of their clinical experts, have been given the opportunity for that surgery. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. The Premier promised that winter hydro disconnections would stop. Well, Georgina lives in Oshawa. She pays her hydro bill to a private company that sub-meters her apartment building and not to the local utility. This private company is regulated by the OEB, but they are not being told to stop disconnection, so Georgina has had her power cut off. What is the Premier going to do to get Georgina's power back on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As mentioned last week, we passed the uh, legislation to, uh, to give the Ontario Energy Board the power to end winter, di winter disconnections uh, within our province, Mr. Speaker. And we were very pleased that the OEB acted uh, quickly and decisively on Thursday of last week, Mr. Speaker. The OEB issued a decision to all utilities, and that would include these companies that banned all disconnects, Mr. Speaker, until April 30th, required currently disconnected customers to be reconnected at no cost, and ordered the removal of any load limiters being used to limit electricity use, Mr. Speaker. The OEB has announced a comprehensive hearing and review process Answer. for customer service rules, and I'd be happy to speak with the member afterwards to ensure that we can get all of the information to help that one Thank individual, you. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It would seem that the minister is also disconnected, but um, I'm more concerned about Georgina right now. Speaker, it turns out that there is a loophole in the Premier's promise that people won't have their power cut off during the winter. The Premier surely must have been briefed about this loophole, but I guess she didn't choose to fix the problem. It looks like the Liberals are more interested again in scoring a political win than really fixing the problem of winter disconnections. Speaker, when did the Premier learn about this loophole, and what is she going to do to close it? Thank you, Minister. 
Again, Mr. Speaker, the OEB has acted quickly on this and in making sure all local utilities will actually stop winter disconnects, Mr. Speaker. It happened last Thursday. We're making sure that everyone, Mr. Speaker, is going to be reconnected as soon as possible. The important thing, Mr. Speaker, is you know we acted on this. We started talking about this in June, and now, Mr. Speaker, we're very pleased to see this happening. And we're going to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that we continue to find ways to help all ratepayers right across the province, Mr. Speaker. We're going to come forward with a real action plan, Mr. Speaker, one that's not based off of ideology and, and not on ideas, Mr. Speaker. We have really good ideas that we're bringing forward, Mr. Speaker. The member from Prince Edward Hastings and the member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound come to order. One wrap-up sentence, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was uh, back in my hometown of Ottawa last night at a meeting organized by the City of Ottawa and councillors uh, with regards to the event. But this is an important issue. Maybe you could listen. The member from Nepean Carlton, come to order. This is a serious issue which should concern us all. There have been three deaths in the City of Ottawa in the last two months that we know of due to fentanyl and. Chief Government Whip, come to order. The member from Nepean Carlton, second time. Finish, please. Fentanyl and opioid overdose, and those are the ones that we know about. There were a lot of very sad stories last night, and one father, Mike, was telling a story of his son who's been addicted for five years. And this is the message that he sent to all of us here. This is new. This is not Question. the drug. Fentanyl is extremely dangerous. What I want to know from the Minister of Community and Correctional Services is what are we doing to get this off? Thank the you. Minister of Community Safety and Community. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. The member from Nepean Carlton is warned. And I don't need anyone else interjecting. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Ottawa South. I'd also like to thank the member for Nepean Carlton for the work that they're doing on this case to raise it here in the House. One more. Uh, my colleague was telling me about some of the stories that he heard yesterday. So, and I think. I would like us to not take this on a partisan approach because we know it's something that was, you know, in Ottawa yesterday. We also know yes, that sir. it's across all of our province, and I will um, explain a little bit what we're doing and how I'm reaching out to our chief of police. Thank, thank you. you very much. Supplementary. Uh, I thank the minister, and I cannot stress the urgency with which uh, that work needs to be done. What Mike said last night was, "This is a different drug. One pill can kill you." The second pill can kill you. The third pill destroys you. So my follow-up question is, what are we doing to make sure that we put naloxone in the hands of our first responders? Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for uh, the member again for his uh, questions. Um, we recently made some changes to enable all paramedics to administer the Naxalon on site. And I want to say thank you to the great work they do, but also the tremendous work our police services have been doing in getting opioids off the streets. And I know they need help, Mr. Speaker, to do better. And uh, Ontario's chief of police have reached out to me to support from our government, and I will work with them. Um, and their police services to address the opioid uh, addiction crisis. And I want to reach out to all the parents of Ontario today uh, in uh, the profound respect, and we will not abandon them. We will be there for them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the Leader of the Massachusetts Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. We all know about the Minister of Energy's mea culpa and hindsight, but the Auditor General found that Liberals ignored the advice of their own energy exports when handing out 20-year contracts 
to Liberal friends. If they had have listened to the Auditor General, it could have saved Ontario four billion dollars. We also know that the 30 big renewable companies donated $1.3 million wow. to the Ontario Liberal Party. So my question to the Premier is, given this hindsight, given this regret about these bad contracts, will the Ontario Liberal Party return the $1.3 million in donations? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise. You know, investing in, uh, in eliminating coal and building transmission, Mr. Speaker, as, as the uh, Leader of the Opposition talked about, was the right thing to do, Mr. Speaker, because our foresight, Mr. Speaker, we have a, a clean, reliable system that we can depend on, Mr. Speaker. But as I said in my speech, yes, hindsight is 2020, and it was the what was correct, Mr. Speaker, not the how. But I know the uh, Leader of the Opposition knows hindsight very well because when it came to the updated uh, sex ed curriculum, Mr. Speaker, he actually used hindsight and changed his mind because they didn't support it and then they did support it. And then he wrote a letter, Mr. Speaker, not supporting it and then he supported it again, Mr. Speaker. Hindsight is something that they know very well, Mr. Speaker. We've recognized on this side that we actually have invested in a system that has built a system that is very strong, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to find ways Thank of you. lowering rates for The member from Chatham Kent, Essex, will come to order. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. Now, Mr. Speaker, I asked a serious question about hydro. The government has acknowledged that their Green Energy Act was a mistake. They signed bad contracts. The response I get from the Minister of Energy was a smear on an unrelated topic. So I will try again, Mr. Speaker, directly to the Premier. Directly to the Premier. How does the Premier reconcile the fact that we've overpaid massively for renewable energy, that if we had listened to the Auditor General, we could have saved Ontarians $4 billion on their hydro bills, and the Ontario Liberal Party received $1.3 million in donations? So a very clear question is, given this acknowledgement, given this mea culpa, will the Premier ensure the Ontario Liberal Party returns the $1.3 million to Ontario ratepayers because of these bad contracts. Question, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, you know, the Green Energy Act, Mr. Speaker, the what was the absolute right thing to do, Mr. Speaker. The how these contracts were negotiated, we, of course, Mr. Speaker, we could do better. And that's what we're actually doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're finding ways of doing better for the people of Ontario and bringing forward a rate mitigation process, Mr. Speaker, that's going to help all families and all businesses across the province. But when talking about savings for people, Mr. Speaker, we've already done that and we're going to continue to do that. The renegotiated Samsung agreement, $3.7 billion in savings, Mr. Speaker. Reduced fit prices, $1.9 billion in savings, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the LRP process saved $1.5 billion. The reduced fit cost, Mr. Speaker, that was $800 million. We've continued to do this, Mr. Speaker, while at the same time eliminating coal yes, and rebuilding a system that they couldn't care for, Mr. Speaker, that they left in shambles. Thank you. Question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Chris and Robina Willis live in London West with their five children. Both have jobs, but like too many working families, they are struggling to keep the lights on. Any time they fall behind on their hydro bills, they must pay hefty fees and a larger deposit, leading to bills as high as $1,000 and forcing them to cut back on necessities. As hydro rates increase, this vicious circle just gets worse. Speaker, why is the Premier ignoring the crisis faced like families faced by families like Chris and Robina Willis and refusing to act now to keep hydro costs affordable. We have already begun to take action, and we are bringing forward a plan that will continue to take action in the immediate term, Mr. Speaker. What's interesting about the questions from the NDP is that the, the document that they brought out yesterday lays out a number of initiatives 
most of which wouldn't reduce electricity prices and none of which would reduce electricity prices in the immediate term, Mr. Speaker. It would take a very long time, and some of them, I have no idea how they would do it in terms of, for example, asking the federal government to take action and forego revenue. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to bring forward a workable plan. We're going to bring Answer. forward a plan, an initiative that builds on the actions that we've already taken, a real plan that will reduce electricity prices Thank you. immediately, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Chris and Robina Willis are doing everything they can to keep up. They have had to use the food bank multiple times. They have removed their children from extracurricular activities. Now they say they will no longer be able to organize birthday parties for their children. Speaker, does this government think it is fair to make children pay the price for their failure to take real action on hydro rates? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, I think uh, everyone in this House would agree, Mr. Speaker, that that's unacceptable that any family would have to do that, Mr. Speaker, and, and that's why we acted and we're continuing to act, Mr. Speaker. When we brought forward the 8 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, that's helping you know, 5 million families across the province with small businesses and farms included in that, Mr. Speaker, but we know there, that more needs to be done, and so that's why we're continuing right now, Mr. Speaker, to work and continue to find ways to help families, because we know, Mr. Speaker, that we had to rebuild that system. It was paramount for us to eliminate coal, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we can have the system that's clean and reliable, but we will take it to the next level, Mr. Speaker. We will work hard to ensure that we make this as affordable as possible for every family, for every business right across our province, from Windsor to Ottawa to Answer. Benora and everything in between, Mr. Speaker. We're working for everyone in this province. Thank you. New question, the member from Kingston and the Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. I know that many Ontarians are aware of what happened last summer with the Tragically Hip's farewell tour. A huge number of hip fans, especially those in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, could not get tickets to see Canada's iconic band. In a matter of seconds across the province, tickets were sold out and they later appeared on the secondary market at very inflated rates. This happens with concerts, sporting events, and all kinds of other cultural events where fans have trouble getting tickets no matter how hard they try. This is why I introduced Bill 22, the Ticket Speculation Amendment Act, last fall. I was delighted that my PMB was supported unanimously, and I'm pleased to be working with the Attorney General to increase consumer protection measures for fans all across this province. Question. I know that our government agrees that we need to take action. Can the Attorney General please tell us about our government? Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank the, the member from Great Kingston question. and the Islands for, for her leadership on this important issue. As she mentioned, she bought a private member's bill to, to make sure that fans do get access to, uh, to tickets that are affordable, that are accessible, uh, and in a transparent way. Uh, what we saw, a Speaker, happen last summer with uh, Tragically Hip's uh, uh, farewell uh, tour where people were not able to get uh, tickets. Uh, if tickets were available, they were available in a, in a, in a much higher price. Uh, I think uh, bugged many Ontarians. It really disturbed me, Speaker, and that is why uh, we have announced our intention to take concrete steps uh, by bringing legislation this spring that will make sure that, that uh, we are putting fans first in Ontario, Speaker, that we are making sure that tickets are accessible uh, um, and uh, um, are affordable uh, for fans, uh, Speaker. So we are working and yes, building on, on members, private members' bill in terms of uh, scalping bots. And in supplementary, I'll give you uh, more information you. in that regard. Thank, thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to thank the Attorney General for his response. Many constituents and fans across the province are pleased to hear that the government is committed to taking action on this issue. By banning scalper bots, our government is sending a clear message to fans that we believe they deserve a fair shot at buying tickets. I'm excited to be co-hosting a Ticket Speculation Fan Roundtable at Ryerson Digital Media Zone tomorrow at 7 o'clock to hear from fans. I know that constituents from all across this province are very happy with the work already underway to give everyone a fair chance, especially when the next big show comes to town. I know the Attorney General would agree that we need to increase transparency in the ticket-selling industry. 
While this is going to be a difficult task, Question. Can the Attorney General please tell us more about our government's plan to ban scalper bots and the work we will be doing in the Thank coming you. months. Thank you very much. Good Speaker, question. again, I want to thank, uh, thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for her leadership, and I very much look forward to joining her uh, tomorrow at the uh, Ryerson University D Digital Media Zone uh, for our consultation with fans, and we in, uh, invite people to attend that event at 7 p.m. Uh, speaker, earlier today, also, uh, Speaker, we launched an online survey at Ontario.ca slash tickets. We encourage Ontarians to please go online and give us advice in four key areas. How how can we uh, make uh, uh, access uh, to tickets uh, uh, more uh, more easy by giving everybody a fair shot at buying tickets? Uh, how can we make them more affordable? Uh, how can we uh, make information about tickets more transparent? And speaker, of course, how can we make sure that these rules are are fully enforced? This is a challenging task, uh, Speaker. There is no silver bullet answer. answer. We are working with other jurisdictions like New York State uh, as well, which have the same kind of challenges to see if we can develop strategies uh, that could be mutually enforceable. And sense. I look working with members and Ontarians on this. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you. New question, the member from Simcoe Gray. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. In October uh, 2016, the Environmental Review Tribunal ruled the appellants of the WPD wind turbine project in Clearview Township had proven the turbines would cause harm to human health and irreversible harm to the natural environment, in particular endangered bats that live in the area. Now WPD is requesting a remedy hearing in the hopes of reversing the tribunal's ruling that safeguards the people and wildlife of this province. Mr. Speaker, why is WPD Canada being given a remedy hearing when the fact of the matter is the government's Freedom of Information records show existing operational wind turbines in Ontario far exceed the approval limits for bat and bird kills. Thank you. Minister of the Environment and, and, uh, and uh, Climate Change. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I am uh, happy to meet with the member opposite to, within the authority I have, review the matter. The minister has uh, limits on our authority because we have an environmental review tribunal, which I have a great deal of faith in. You may remember you, the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, repeatedly questioned me about the Collingwood Airport issue, and I said I cannot insert myself in that because I legally have no authority to do it, and I would probably have to resign if I did that. It's interesting. It's interesting. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the, that the hearing resulted in changes made by the ERT with no interference from Answer. the government or the ministry, and I think somewhat to the satisfaction of the member opposite. So let's have some faith in our independent tribunal process. Thank you. Back to the uh, minister. It, minister, it's your policy that the tribunal is following. It's your Green Energy Act that the tri tribunal is following, so you are ultimately responsible for this issue. It's been proven that wind turbine turbines kill resident bats and also attract migratory bats and kill them as well. Local residents and governments are spending excessive amounts of their own money doing what the minister should be doing, and that's enforcing the Endangered Species Act by refusing to issue permits to high-risk wind turbine projects. Speaker, this government's Green Energy Act is creating energy poverty with a high cost of electricity, and it's now bringing about project poverty by forcing citizens to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to oppose wind turbine projects and protect the environment. Mr. Speaker, is the minister committed to protecting Ontario's endangered species, or do wind turbine projects take priority? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would be very clear that we have, with the Endangered Species Act of the Minister of Natural Resources and uh, Forestry, very strong protections. As a matter of fact, we have the strongest protections in North America on endangered species. I would also point out, Mr. Speaker, that we and Quebec and Nova Scotia are the only jurisdictions in the Americas that have greenhouse gas reductions below 1990 levels or have met the Kyoto Protocol, which his party took us out of. Our 
energy system now and our environmental strategies have left us as one of only three jurisdictions in the Americas that are below 1990 levels and tracking on that. And given the leader of his party and his colleagues who have a track record of destroying international agreements, undermining them, and increasing pollution in this province and increasing greenhouse gas emissions, which would do a lot yes, more damage than just the bats, Mr. Speaker. Your question? We're from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For people living in Windsor, like Mary, even the most basic services are more and more out of reach. I'm not talking about luxuries. Mary doesn't have a pool, a hot tub, or even a dishwasher. As she says, it's just basic living. And the price for basic living? A $200 electricity bill, double what she was paying last year. Will this Liberal government listen to Mary, finally admit that electricity is a necessity, not a luxury, and begin to treat it that way? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to, to continue to find ways to help people like Mary and every other family and person and business in this province, Mr. Speaker. We did start by, uh, you know, starting on January 1st with the 8% reduction, and for those R2 customers in the province, 330,000 households, Mr. Speaker, they're seeing a $60.50 reduction, Mr. Speaker. And we know we can do more. There are programs in place to help people like Mary. I do hope that Mary is looking at some of those programs, but we will find ways and we are working hard right now, Mr. Speaker, to continue to find ways to reduce costs. But we do recognize that the system that we built, Mr. Speaker, um, eliminating coal, rebuilding the grid, that cost billions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, and we know that cost actually came uh, at the expense of many families, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we are now yes, looking sir. at ways of ensuring that we can continue to find some downward pressure on rates and bring immediate Thank action you. and relief. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Not a day goes by in Windsor where I don't hear yet another hydro horror story. Parents can't buy school supplies for their children, enroll them in sports, or send them to summer camp, all because of their skyrocketing hydro bill. Businesses can't afford to expand. Some have already closed. I invite the Premier to come to Windsor and actually listen to how difficult it's becoming to afford even the most basic needs like hydro, food, or medication for seniors. I'll introduce her to my constituents. I'll even buy her lunch. People in Windsor need action, not more Liberal talking points. They need more than $5 off this month and maybe $6 off the next. Will this Liberal government end the sell-off of Hydro One and offer a real plan to lower electricity bills? Once again, Mr. Speaker, as we said, there are several programs in place that actually help these families significantly, Mr. Speaker, in terms of dollars that they're saving every month when it comes to their electricity bill. We're also making sure, Mr. Speaker, as I said before, that that 8% reduction, that started out of January 1st, Mr. Speaker, and that's a significant reduction for many families and farms and businesses right across the province, and that took effect as of January 1st, and many of those families are now seeing the full benefit to that, Mr. Speaker, now that we're at the end of February. So, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that, you know what, the, ins the investments that we made in this system, making sure that we're off coal, making sure that we have a clean system, a reliable system, and one that we can count on, Mr. Speaker, that came with a cost. And now, Mr. Speaker, we're taking it to the next level. We're working hard on finding other yes, ways sir. that we can reduce costs for not only this family, as was mentioned, Mr. Speaker, but all families and businesses right across our great province. Thank you. New question. The member from Brent, uh, Brent in Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that our government has committed to end chronic homelessness by 2025. We recognize that all of us have a shared responsibility to the most vulnerable amongst us in the communities that we call home. I'm pleased to see that our government has significantly increased the Region of Peel support from Ontario's Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative. CHPI helps thousands of at-risk families and individuals retain and find secure housing and allow them to build healthy and stable lives. This year, Peel is receiving $15.3 million from CHPI, and by 2018-19, this investment in homelessness prevention in Peel will grow to $17.8 million. Mr. Speaker, this is great news. Can the minister please tell the 
of this House how the CHPI increases will help ensure that all Ontarians are given the supports that they deserve. Thank you. Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member for Brampton Springdale for that great question. I'm proud to say, Speaker, that Ontario is a leader in the fight against uh, homelessness. To reach our goal of ending chronic homelessness, we're focusing on prevention. I can report all areas of Ontario received an increase in community homeless uh, prevention initiative, we call it CHIPI, funding this year, significantly increased funding in Durham, York, Peel, Halton uh, regions and other communities will help these service managers better support the needs right across their communities. This funding will decrease the need for people to migrate to Toronto to seek service. CHIPI provides services people need to rebuild their lives like housing, transportation assistance and life skills coaching. Mr. Speaker, we're investing more and more every year in all communities in Ontario to help them fight homelessness in their streets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to see that Ontario is taking strong action by empowering municipalities across the province in this fight against homelessness. I want to take this time and recognize the many frontline staff who demonstrate the strength of our community in supporting our most vulnerable in my riding of Brampton Springdale. A community isn't a bunch of people living in the same place. It's a shared sense of responsibility to one another and that both our successes and our struggles bind us together. Even still, we know that more work needs to be done. Can the minister explain to this House what the government is doing to encourage the community leadership and ensure wraparound solutions to those who need our help the most? Thank you, minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. And again, thank you to the member for the question and, and to our municipal partners across Ontario who are working hard to end homelessness. Speaker, we began our work by striking an expert panel on homelessness and used their input to shape the path, our path and the path forward. We're focusing our efforts to prevent homelessness on those most at risk, including the chronically homeless, uh, homeless youth, Indigenous people, and individuals transitioning out of provincial institutions. Speaker, we know chronic homelessness is a serious symptom of other obstacles like drug addiction, mental health challenges, and disabilities. So in the coming weeks, we're moving forward with an unprecedented investment in housing with supports to help eliminate the obstacles that keep people in a cycle of homelessness, freeing them to rebuild their lives and maintain stable homes. And I really look forward, Speaker, to sharing the details Answer. soon. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, Grenville. My question is for the uh, Minister of Environment. I want to replay the facts, uh, Speaker. In February, the Minister of the Environment announced the $14,000 Tesla luxury car rebate. I have the press release right here to prove it. It's supposedly a part of his action plan. And around the same time, the minister's former chief of staff started working at Tesla. But then the minister claims his office had nothing to do with the decision. It was the Minister of Transportation. So my question, Speaker, is simple. Yes or no, did the Minister of Environment's office participate in the luxury car rebate program? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Thank you Climate very much, Mr. Speaker. I think we've been very clear on this. Uh, it was last spring that the decisions were made, and they were made by the government that the Ministry of Transportation is the administrative unit. They developed the program. And number three, Mr. Speaker, the person involved, the staffer, did exactly what I would want and I think we'd want our staffers to do. They immediately, upon looking to leave government, went to the Integrity Commissioner, met with the Integrity Commissioner. I got a letter that was copied on that. The Integrity Commissioner said that they followed all of the rules, and I would hope that we would have respect for people who follow the rules, Mr. Speaker, which was the case here, and that should end it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Now, again, I want to reiterate, Speaker, this press release from the government on this program change came from his ministry, oh. the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. It's ago. time for this government to put their money where their mouth is, maybe their emails where their mouth is. I filed an order paper question. I can go under Freedom of Information, but I'm going to ask the minister this question. Will he release all of the emails that contain the word Tesla that were issued by his former chief of staff? Yes or no? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I will say it again. 
This decision was made by the government last spring, clearly made by the government. The decision was made last spring. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke is warned. And the member from Nipissing will come to order. Finish, please. Again, when the, when the political staffer involved decided to leave government, he did what every political staffer should do, went and met with the integrity commissioner, right. did a full disclosure, then got a letter back giving him complete clearance and rules to follow, and he's Answer. followed those rules, Mr. Speaker. Again, the— Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. New question? The member from Temiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Horn Granite Curling Club is a cornerstone in the community of New Lister, as are many curling clubs and ice rinks. And tragically, a few years ago, it burned to the ground. And through the dedication of its members and support for the community, it was totally rebuilt. It's totally modern. It, it faced a huge challenge, but now it faces an even greater challenge. Last year, the membership fees for the Horn Granite Curling Club were $42,000. Their hydro bill was $46,000. Wow. So you know where that's going. How is it that we've come to this, that our rural way of life is being destroyed by your hydro policies? Mr. Speaker, um, it is great to yes, talk about curling, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, Sudbury has a great curling club as well, and the Coppercliff Curling Club, Mr. Speaker, have come to me and talked to me about their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker. And you know what I did is I put them in touch with their local utility, their local utility that went in and worked with them on the Save on Energy program, Mr. Speaker. And the Save on Energy program, Mr. Speaker, is now saving that curling club thousands of dollars every month, Mr. Speaker. So I encourage that member to utilize the local utilities that are within your area, use the programs that are in place, Mr. Speaker, because we rebuilt this system. We've made sure it's clean, and now we're making sure it's affordable for every single business and for every single person in this province, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, with all due respect, this example, it's a brand new facility. They've done everything that they could to save energy. They have worked with every program available, as have most people in this province. I'm sure most, the vast majority, anyone who comes in our office, we make sure that we look for every program available. And yet, and yet this club and many others like it are in danger of closing because they can't pay their hydro bill. The real question is, the real question is, your ministry has analysts, policy analysts, experts, long-term energy plans. How did you not foresee this happening? Why did it have to come to crisis before you realize that, oh, the people in rural Western. Ontario can't pay their hydro bills? Oh, perhaps we have to do something. How? How did it come to Thank this you. with your energy program? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It came to this, Mr. Speaker, because for decades the opposition parties, when they were in power, never invested in the system, and it was up to us to rebuild it, Mr. Speaker. And that doesn't happen overnight, Mr. Speaker. We've rebuilt the system. We've made sure it's clean. We've made sure it's green, Mr. Speaker. And now we've made sure that we've got a system that we can rely on. We're going to continue to work hard, Mr. Speaker, for the folks that are in rural parts of our province. We've started, Mr. Speaker, with the $60.50. Uh, triple RP reduction, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to find ways of finding programs that, Mr. Speaker, that will help these organizations, just like we did in Sudbury, just like we've done in Thunder Bay, just like we've done right across our great province, Mr. Speaker. And we'll continue to find ways to help Answer. not only in rural but in urban parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change concerning the electric car rebate program. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.